authors is a judge named Younger. He was a Supreme Court justice in New York. He died about 10 years ago. And a lot of his lectures on cross-examination are played for law schools still all over the country. He was brilliant at it. And he made the comment that he had heard in 30 years on the bench fewer than five attorneys who could do cross-examination. So it is not just unique to the debate community. Uh, it exists in the law, too. It's a missed opportunity at 100 levels. I'd love to play some of his tapes for you, but part of the reason that he's so powerful for law students is that he's, his lectures are filled with uh, profanity and totally inappropriate examples, which is why everybody remembers his stuff, but uh, I would prefer not to get sued uh, and in the workshop, so I will use some of his examples, but they will be cleaned up a little bit. So here's the other cool thing. Uh, I'm going to tell you what to write down and when to write down. And outside of that, I'd like you to just listen. This, is a, this kid is so adorable. He asked me for my outline. <clears throat> I'm going to give you an outline as I go. But basically, I think that debate is about credibility. Everything else being equal, a judge will always vote for the team that looks like they know the most. If it's a dead tie, the bank of credibility, your holdings in the bank of credibility, determine whether you win a debate or not. So we're going to work on that today. Cross-examination is an amazing opportunity to build capital in the bank of credibility. And there are ways in which you can also take your partner and a host of other situations in a debate round, the dynamics of the room with a judge, an opponent team, and your colleague and put those all into motion to make you look smart. Whether you are or not is an issue that you can take up with your school counselors and your parents, but the performance element, the credibility element of it, is definitely fueled in cross-examination. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a couple of purposes of cross-examination, which I think you need to know. Uh, then we're going to give tips for the questioner. If you're the questioner, these are tips that you can use to do well. This is the strategy and tactics part of it. If people would do this, there's a whole lot of good stuff that would come out of it in the debate round. And then we're going to give tips. I'm going to give you tips for being the witness. Uh, and then we'll do questions. And unless you have a burning question, I'd rather just get through it and have some time at the end to do that. Uh, if, if it's just terribly confusing, let me know. Raise your hand, whatever. Now, let me, let me first of all just talk about the dynamics of a room. When you stand up in front of a room, there's a lot of stuff that's going on. So, for example, I'd like everybody on the back row to stand up. <laughs> now, these are the cool people. Because the cool people sit on the back row. And they park themselves back there because they think they have less scrutiny from whoever is speaking. So you can pass notes, draw pictures, do Facebook, you know, whatever. Uh, at the end, you're adorable. Uh, at the end of the day, though, uh, most people focus on the back row. There is very little that the back row does that any teacher worth spit is not paying attention to. So, these people are cool. I want you to give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. You may be seated. Now, front row, stand up. <laughs> yes, you can stand up. You got them beat by a row. Okay, now, these people, everyone perceives to be you know, the goody two-shoes people who are there to be in the front row with the teacher and whatever. I personally believe that these people could commit murder and no teacher would notice. They have figured this out. So while the back row is the cool people, the second of this first row is the smart people. So give them a round of applause. Thank you. The rest of you are citizens. Congratulations. <laughs> or a little confused, one of the two, I'm not sure. Okay. Three purposes of cross-examination. Three purposes of cross-examination. This is why it's important and it's not extended prep time. Number one, write this down, clarifying information. 
clarifying information. If you have no idea what they're talking about, ask them a question. If they make a whole argument on ocean thermal gradients and you have no idea what that is, ask them. Don't pretend like you know. Clarifying information, just asking questions. If you didn't understand something, ask. It doesn't hurt you to ask a question. <laughs> Number two, setting up your arguments. Setting up your arguments. Now the first cross X on each side is usually aimed at this objective. Setting up links for disadvantages, setting up arguments for counter plan, all of that happens in that first cross X. Trapping somebody into using the wrong word so that you can attack them. This is the kind of thing that goes on in that first one. Depending on what side you are, you're anticipating what answer, what arguments are going to be made against you, and you are erecting or setting up those answers in the beginning. So setting your arguments up is pretty simple. Lawyers do this all the time. Debaters should do it. But after the first two cross sexes, it pretty much becomes prep time. That's a wasted opportunity. Number three, and my personal favorite, discovery of the witness's knowledge, your opponent's knowledge. Discovery of your opponent's knowledge. Is this person prepared? Do they know what they t they're talking about? Can they defend their positions? Do they have an IQ over 12? This will be discovered pretty quickly in the opening moments of the cross-examination. So these are three purposes that inform how the debate progresses and are opportunities for use throughout the debate. So, suggestions for the questioner. Suggestions for the questioner. You're in charge. You're asking the questions. The opponent doesn't know what questions you're going to ask, so you have a distinct advantage. And most of these suggestions are built around capitalizing on that advantage. Number one, absolutely the most important, star it, underline it. If you hear nothing else, I want you to hear this one. Don't try to force your opponent to give up. Don't try to force your opponent to give up. People, this is a room full of egomaniacs. You're not at camp with kayaks. There's no whittling going on here. You went to debate camp. You're engaged in intellectual jousting. You're using your brain. And somewhere secretly in the recesses, I don't care if you're a beginner or you're one of the top debaters in the country, somewhere in your brain there is this little fantasy that you can ask a series of questions so devastating, so powerful, so intellectually rigorous, so horrific that your opponent descends into a quivering mass of jello on the floor, goes, oh, in the face of your brilliance, I can't, I'm just leaving now, Judge, I'm sorry, I just can't even be in the presence of this kind of magnificence. <laughs> okay, get over your bad self, it's not going to happen. You know why? Because the people you're debating against are egomaniacs too, and even if they're not in your intellectual airspace, they're not going to just roll over and play dead. Now, on the off chance that there is a serious mismatch at a mental health and age level, and this might happen to you, it doesn't come out the way that you think it might. And I can actually remember high school, and I can actually remember this happening one time in this poor, unfortunate ninth grader got put into a top varsity division for some reason. I have no idea. Coach should have been shot, not me. I just asked one question. Kid bursts into tears. Let me tell you, it makes you feel like this. The judge is looking at you like you're an expert. I asked a simple question. I didn't hit the kid. I didn't step on his foot. I did nothing. He just was, uh, he didn't want to be there. He didn't understand anything we'd said. I asked one question and it was bad. And so this is what you do. Your little fantasies come to, the kid is totally broken. And so instead, you're looking at the room, all looking at you and her, and you're like, oh, thank you, that's fine. We don't need to do any more questions. I'll be going back to my seat now. You just, uh, I think 
uh, we could get some Valium or something for you. <laughs> I feel better. You feel like crap. Don't do it. Don't do it. You want to beat a person because your arguments are so much better than theirs that that is how the defeat happens. And by the way, you do this very politely. You kill with kindness. Because the judge is sitting in the back of the room, and if you come off as some big bully, the judge is sitting there going, most of them high school teachers and a lot of places nationally, are sitting there going, oh, I have a child like this at home. I hate them. How few speaker points can I give this kid? Okay, it's 30 points scale three. Do you think I could get away with three? What a terrible person. Instead, you want to be generous while crushing somebody. You want to kill them with kindness. Smile. There's nothing wrong. It doesn't say you're stupid to smile. Use your business. If you got some business going, half of you have braces. That's okay. They'll come off someday. Practice your smile. <laughs> Practice it. It will get you dates down the road. It is a good thing. And also, when you are pleasant, as the questioner in cross-examination, and the judge is sitting there going, wow, I wish my kid was like that. How many points can I give this child? There is a lot of stuff going on that has to do with stuff outside the debate ground. Capitalize it. Don't go into it with the idea that you're going to force your opponent to concede, that your intellectual superiority will totally crush a human being. Your arguments should totally crush the human being. And you crush them while smiling. Is that clear? Yeah. Excellent. OK, number two, ask questions. Ask questions. Oh, this is a great lecture. It's cross-examination, and her second suggestion is ask questions. All right. Ask questions. Don't make speeches. You people can't help yourselves. You ask the first question. You're trying to get them on record. You're discussing their funding mechanism. You're asking them how much revenue is going to be generated from fill-in-the-blank funding mechanism. They answer, and you go, well, how is that possible given the trade-offs? in Congress between this incredibly important program and your stupid little program and blah, 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 and you start making this speech. What a waste of time. You have three little precious minutes, and the witness is going to get part of that time. Ask questions. Get information. The more they talk, the more they're likely to say something totally wrong. And if they say something totally wrong, you can capitalize on that and use it to defeat them down the road and make you look slick and get you extra speaker points, which you're, if you're on the bubble, gets you out of the tournament. There's a lot of speaker points tied to cross-examination. It is worth it to do it right. A judge expects you to use that cross-ex efficiently. And half the debates that you have at the tournament, you write this down. Half the, not, not really. <laughs> gotcha. OK, you're listening. That's good. Uh, half the debates, people are going to make speeches. Don't do it. Resist the urge. Ask questions. Number three, know when to stop. Know when to stop. Debate is a timed activity. If you're a beginner, the first round will feel like an eternity, and you will not be able to, to fill your time up. By round two, you're going to get it better. By round three, you will never have enough time again in your entire debate career. It is a very hard activity because you've got more to say than you have time to say it. That said, you undermine yourself in a lot of ways. And I'm going to use Judge Younger for this example, <clears throat> dramatically cleaned up. I want to make the analogy between a debate round and a trial. So uh, the prosecution is basically like the affirmative. They have to overcome the presumption of innocence of the defendant, who is the negative. And in doing so, they determine the outcome of the trial by making arguments which are like rebuttals to the jury. The jury serves like the judges and makes the decision in the trial. So let's say that I am the defense attorney. I've got the witness for the, the big prosecution witness on the stand. And this is how the, the cross-examination goes. Um, so you claim to have seen the accident. Is that right? Yes. OK. How, how, uh, what time of day or night did the accident occur? It was around midnight, maybe 1230, something like that. OK, thank you. 
so where were you located at the time of the accident? I was about a mile, mile and a half away. Uh, okay, I can't help but notice that your glasses resemble magnifying glasses. Do you have a vision, vision problem? Yeah, uh, let's see, I'm legally blind in, I um, think, 33 states. Stop! For heaven's sake, stop! What do you say? This person cannot possibly be used to prosecute my client. It was in the dead of night. He was a mile and a half away. The guy is legally blind in 33 states. And you're thinking, this is the greatest gift ever given to any attorney. Stop. You have reduced the credibility by just asking those questions. But no, you can't stand it. You got to go, well, how could you possibly have seen the accident? Well, I'm a bird watcher. And I was up in a tree with a pair of high-powered binoculars. I saw the whole thing because it happened under a street light. Now, you have just given precious cross-examination time to a witness to allow them to explain away. Now, the, the notion that we're going to be determining truth in a debate, get, get over that. It's not, not, not happening. We are making comparative <coughs> calculations about what is the right thing to do. We're not establishing truth. Are you ultimately going to have to deal with the defense uh, uh, or the prosecution excavating that crop? Yeah, absolutely. But you've planted doubt in the mind of the judge. It's going to take that attorney time to unpack what you've done, and it's still going to raise credibility doubt <clears throat> because if the guy's legally blind, it doesn't really matter that all those things are happening. There is still reasonable doubt that your client was guilty. You are trying to establish on the negative reasonable doubt. And in the affirmative, you are un overwhelming that reasonable doubt. And the way you talk about that matters. OK, number four. Control the cross-examination. Control the cross-examination. You're in charge. You know the questions. They don't. You're about to find out if they know how to answer them. How do we do this? There are four subpoints. A, be polite. Be polite. This is not time for the playground bully. OK, I have four questions. I'd like you to answer yes or no. We have 10 seconds. Go. Yeah, see, the judge, they, they don't respond well to that. Be polite, kill with kindness, smile. Uh, what are the two parts of an argument? Oh my God, speak it up, claim and warrant. How many of you know that? Thank you, it's day three of the Institute. It's about to have a have a staff meeting this afternoon. Okay, stop chatty Charlie. This is B, A, be polite, B, stop chatty Charlie. You're trying to get to the warrant for the claim of their argument. You're asking piercing questions about the methodology of their authors, their conclusions, their bias, etc. You got Chatty Charlie. You ask a question, blah, 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 blah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Your answer is blah, 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 blah. Now, you can let this happen. Or you can control the cross-examination, partly with your face, partly with your kindness, partly with your generosity. So blah, 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 blah. Thank you. <clears throat> your answer is sufficient. Blah, blah. No, really, I've just got, got a couple more questions, if you could just. And if they don't answer the question, that's ammunition in your speech. It reduces their credibility. But your generosity contrasts to their inability to answer the question. But you've got to try to control that, get the questions out so that you can get answers to set your arguments up. And you do that with kindness in the same way that being polite contrasts with people who are bullies. If you ask a question reasonably and somebody tries to talk over you like they think they're on Fox or CNN or MSNBC or something, then that's, that's just not going to go well. You know, we love train wrecks. It sells products on television. doesn't work in debate rounds. 
So you want to be a contrast to the bad style of the person that you're speaking with. So A, be polite. B, stop chatting Charlie. <coughs> C, stop the filibuster. What's a filibuster? It does mean when, like, usually in politics, when a politician keeps speaking just to block the, for passing a bill or block, block voting. I can think of um, Strom Thurmond as a very famous example. He wrote a phone book to prevent voting on that. Man, me, Strom Thurmond, and Ted Cruz read Green Eggs and Ham. Okay, that's a specific example of a filibuster. But you all are good at the filibuster. And it is a more general concept. You have a curfew, <clears throat> show up an hour late. Whichever adult lives in your house shows up. You, uh, you've been home an hour, you don't know if they know or not. So, when did you get home, son? You got this moment of, oh my, do I tell the truth, get in trouble, because maybe I'll get a lenient sentence for telling the truth, or maybe they don't know, and I should go for it, and I should try. And so most of you pick the middle ground, which goes something like this. Well, when we talk about time, that is a concept, and I'm <laughs> learning about it in science as a linear versus, you know, quantum uh, idea that could be unpacked in many ways, and so that is a filibuster, stalling. Preventing action by talking incessantly or refusing to participate. Stop the filibuster. You ask a question about funding. You need it for your disadvantage. You've got to find out what's going to happen. Uh, and so you ask the question and they go, well, you know, when you talk about funding, there are many elements. There are resources, personnel, um, there are, you know, in-kind things that may or may not require additional revenues. There are, yeah, when they start doing that, kill with kindness, be generous, say, oh, you know, I just need a ballpark figure. If you could just provide that for me, we can get through all that other stuff. You're, you're being generous. You know, thank you for the depth of your capacity to destroy the cross X. Would you please just give, you know, a ballpark. You're reasonable. And your face is communicating to the judge, I'm trying so hard, and this person is a blithering idiot and driving me nuts, and I'd like to terminate their life, but I really can't because <laughs> I have a test on Monday and I have to go to school, so I can't kill them today. So you're sweetly asking questions and trying to do what you can. If you let them filibuster, they will. Try to control what happens in the cross-examination. Number four. Control the physical space. Control the physical space. I need a prop for this. Where are my late people? <laughs> Cute hair. I'll take that one in the black shirt. Wait, is this four-point thunder number four? A, B, C, D. All right. So I'm about to cross-examine this person. And the first thing that you should notice is who's he looking at? You. Why? You all are the judges. He doesn't care what I look like. We're not going on a date. I'm married. <laughs> so this is, this is a problem. So I asked this kid a question, and I'm not thinking, you know, I'm substantially more experienced. I assume I'm smarter because all debaters are egomaniacs. So I'm asking a question, and he answers it. And I'm sitting here, lo and behold, listening to his answer because it's better than I thought it was. And what am I doing to him? Putting him in the back. Anybody had theater? What am I doing to him? I'm upstaging him. Now, if he's smart, he'll come up with me. And so as I ask my next question, I'm coming back. And what does he do? Yes, he's getting it. Okay, now we could cha-cha. That's a dance you don't know unless you're courting. Uh, and that looks stupid. So one of the issues that we have in controlling the physical space is that we as Americans have this inviolable body space. We have a rectangle around us that we don't want anybody in there unless they're invited. And let me also tell
tell you that if you have to stand next to an old lady with cooties, by God, it's even worse. <laughs> Thank you. Give him a round of applause. Now, I am not recommending that you try to run a kid into a table or a piano or whatever's in their mind. I do not think that's good. My point is there is a physical performance dimension to cross-examination. And you have to size up not who your opponent is, but who are you? How do you come across? If you are a very tall or large person, particularly if you're male, because we live in a gendered society, I'm going to get there in a minute, uh, you, you look threatening if you're standing next to a smaller person. So you got to dial it back. If you're a smaller person, this does not mean wear stilts. It, it just means to be aware of the situation. How do you come across? How do you project? How do you make your presence known in a round? You can compensate for all kinds of stuff. But at the end of the day, people have expectations based on how we look. There have been academic studies for the last 30 years <clears throat> that suggest the following. The least credible speakers, these are academic studies, the least credible speakers are women, people of color, teenagers. That means we are sitting in a room of terribly low credibility humans. <laughs> Least credible speakers. Now, what do we do to overcome that? Change. We do, and we are going to, but the revolution is coming. But, shh, listen. We are so prepared, so credible, so intent on sharing the knowledge that we have worked hard for that we overcome that stereotype. We do. I know the last thing, you know, what have they done? They brought in an old fat white woman to talk to us. I can't believe we have to do this. Where's her and he's funny at least? <laughs> You've got to overcome that stereotype. And that can happen. And when it does, you will do better than those who are deemed credible speakers. Obama did not do well in the first debate against Romney because he so disrespected the man that he didn't do the preparation necessary and dialed it in. I've been judging these things since <clears throat> the beginning of debate with Lincoln and Douglas, and uh, it was terrible, totally unexpected. Obama's 20 times the speaker Romney is. God, Romney talked about the trees in Michigan and how he loved them. Oh, <clears throat> still makes me hurt. Uh, second debate, Obama got out of his funk, did his preparation, was not close. Extremely well done. And overcame every stereotype that a tall, white, rich man played in the first debate. And it was a crushing success. And everybody knew the third debate was going to go to Obama because it was foreign policy. And Romney had been to England and managed to insult people in just the few months before the debates. He had the, his foreign policy experience was helping put the Olympics on. He had more than Sarah Palin. I could see Russia for my husband. <laughs> <laughs> so history would record, history would record will record the debates as 2-1 Obama. But the story of that election was the first debate made it an election. And Romney used every ounce of I'm a white, powerful, dominant male who deserves the privilege I have been handed. Overcome your stereotypes, which leads me to number whatever, A, B, C, D, E. Respect, diversity, and difference. Respect, diversity, and difference.
I love it. I've been lecturing at this camp for 100 years. For the first 70 of those years, this audience would have been all white male, three women, one person of color. That was debate. That's who it was geared for. 75% of Congress people, 80% of captains of industry, 40% of U.S. presidents all participated in, in debate. Vast majority were white and male. It is training for leadership. It makes you smart. It gives you advocacy skills. You can make a difference because we don't teach people to talk and communicate in this society. We teach you to write. You can make a topic sentence and follow that with arguments why, but if I ask you to speak it, you fall apart. We just did a consulting program for the Centers for Disease Control. We had 20 folks in the room who were all PhDs, doctors, and whatever the advanced form of nurse is. I don't know all the letters. <clears throat> really smart people. And we had them debating a topic about whether health was a human right to prepare them to go to Congress and testify because they get so upset when a congressman asks them a stupid question. Preventive health care is building a playground in the middle of the Bronx? That's so stupid, would say Congressman Yokel from Arkansas. And if you're from Arkansas, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> they don't get the connection here between preventive health and the way that we have bifurcated our culture, segregated it, and thrown away half the population in education, health care, job training, etc. And so I had this one guy who's really smart, and we had the argument building sessions. He just he had 50 reasons why this was true. Uh, we were talking after it was over, and one of the staff that I had with me asked the question of him, and he totally fell apart. He didn't know how to answer it. And I said, what is wrong with your brain that if you write it down, you can do it well, but if I ask you the question, you lose all your passion, and your brain just takes a hike? And he goes, oh, what I, we were talking about, and then but we stop to think about what is that? We don't teach people oral communication. We teach written communication. That means every one of you, if you just have one year of debate, are going to be at an advantage over most of the people in the United States because you've ever had to practice that skill. So make a difference in the world. That's why I'm here. I expect you to make a difference in the world. And I want to start <clears throat> by talking about how hard it is to talk across difference. We've got a lot of this going on in debate. The Urban Debate Leagues were founded here at Emory in 1985. We had no idea what we were doing at the time, by the way. And for 10 years, we just screwed it up. But at the end of 10 years, we had a pretty good product. And we had a lot of really smart kids that graduated out of that. And we're going on and making a difference in their communities. One young lady in our early years in Baltimore was so appalled to be researching about federal energy policy, figured out there was asbestos in her school because that was her affirmative and started looking at her school and determined to be a lawyer so that she could clean up her school. I expect every one of you to do the same thing. <clears throat> now, it's hard. So let's talk about it for a minute. It's hard to have conversations. People make each other feel bad. More conversation is better than no conversation, is better than hiding out from conversation. And let me illustrate it with this personal example. Now, I have been married since the beginning of time. <laughs> Now, a lot of people are married a long time, and they hate each other. They're involved in these sadomasochistic wars. Nobody wants to go to dinner with them. Their children hate them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but, we're actually not like that. He's a teacher, too, and a professor, and a debate person. And so we never brought our work home, and we were sort of all about the conversation. And he's also funny, and he's smart, and he's a great dad. Uh, we're the same age, and the toy store is still his favorite store. Our children love him. So he's a great guy, fun to live with. Don't settle. Go get one of those. I don't care what size, shape, color, age. Just don't settle. You people settle. You think after you're 18, you'll look terrible, and nobody will want to smooch with you. Get over that. 
Don't settle. Have a good life. So we have this one little problem. I'm insane about our high school tournament that we run every year in January. I care about it a lot. We have a big intercollegiate debate team at Emory. We have great coaches. We have a huge community set of programs that we work in housing authority communities and urban debate leagues and education all over the country. The high school tournament matters to me a lot because I think we have to serve the high school community and respect all the hard work that your teachers do and that you do. So the first five years we were married, <coughs> You could about put it on a calendar that sometime in that two, three weeks before the tournament, I would come home and totally melt down. Oh, the rooms are there, the trophy orders are the weather, they're not getting the field damage, I was like, he'd go, oh, well, you could fix it. You could do this, or this, or this, or this. And the more he talked, the madder I got. By the end of the night, he was in the doghouse. Neither one of us really knew what happened because we usually talk stuff out, but it irritated me. Year five, same thing. Did I say on a calendar? Come home. Oh, this little ice storm is like, oh, this is going to wreck the tourists, the transportivists, whatever. And he goes, you could fix that. And I went, shut up. I said, I'm a smart woman. I'm going to figure this out tomorrow. But right now, I want you to sit on this sofa with me and put your arm around me, and I want you to be upset with me and wallow in it with me. And he goes, oh, okay. So he sits down on the arm, you know. And we're, you know, when you're in relationship, you teach each other. You know what you can get away with with your parents and what you can't. You adjust. Well, that's been pretty easy for us. But it's not instinctive. It's not instinctive. So. 30 years later, this last January, when I came home, and I was like, well, that's really not another stupid ice cream. I can wreck the church of all these people. Blah, blah. And he goes, well, you could. And I go like this. And he goes, oh, right, the sofa. The sofa. <laughs> oh, let's sit on the sofa. Let me put my, oh, I'm so sorry. You're upset. I bet you'd like to blow up a building, wouldn't you? Wouldn't that make you feel better? OK, what's going on here? We've had decades of this dance. What is about? What is this about? A lot of it is that our gender is constructed. Our gender is constructed. I'm not talking about sexual orientation. I'm talking about our gendered roles as male and female. <coughs> Even our transgendered roles, whatever we want to be, has already been constructed for us. <coughs> Have you been to the toy store? There's the girl aisle, still pink at Target, and the blue aisle, still blue at Walmart, and the pink aisle has little bake ovens, and little vacuum cleaners, and little dolls that do all kinds of disturbing <laughs> <laughs> well, What's up with that? Men are the majority of the engineers in the United States, but they can't push the button on the vacuum cleaner? What the hell is that? Excuse me. What is that about? <laughs> I try, really try. <laughs> really try. Shift gears, not college, high school, high school. Uh, okay. No. No, get out of town. Okay. So the blue aisle, by the way, has all the cool stuff. It's got all kinds of erector sets, things to build with, Legos, although the princess Legos are killing me in the girl aisle. Uh, so, so we construct gender, and this informs the way we talk to each other. So men tend to one up or one down, whatever gets them the most status in the conversation. Uh, Deborah Tannen at Georgetown is a famous sociolinguist. She's done studies on this. And so it looks something like, <clears throat> you had a bad day, men talking to men. I had a bad week. You had a bad week, I had a bad month. You had a bad month, my mother was in labor for 72 hours giving birth to me and she's still not happy with me. <laughs> what gets you the most status in the conversation? Women tend to be consensual. 
We all sit in a circle with our knees touching, and our job is happiness. We are all going to be happy. We are not leaving this room until we are all happy. Do you hear that? And as a result, we wait to be invited to things. We do not interrupt at meetings. We are not assertive because our job is happiness and vacuuming. <laughs> now, <clears throat> what's up with this? When I talk about this, the women are, about half of you, are going, huh, sister, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> they suck, men are terrible, and blah, blah, blah. The vast majority of the males in here are going like this. <laughs> because you see, if you're in charge, you do not have to nod and affirm the speaker. You're in charge. When my son was born, I did not go, go oh boy, it's a boy, he's going to be in charge. <laughs> and let me just tell you something, folks. The guys... The two or three of you in here who nodded with me, you're going to get more dates. That's <laughs> going on. So you look sensitive and thoughtful, and you affirm what somebody says. It's good stuff. This is the non-debate part of this presentation. <laughs> Go with it. Okay. It's not that one is right or wrong. They just are. If we can't talk across gender lines, how hard is it to talk across ethnic lines or racial lines or religious lines? How hard is it to talk across difference <clears throat> because we say <coughs> stupid things to each other? And it is a source of great irritation. How much of the Congress, the judiciary, the business community is still largely white and male? I don't have anything against white males. I counted 10 of you in here. Shockingly low. Shockingly low. I love it. And look, it's not. Listen. It's okay. It's okay. But the power is not proportional. We are not cleaning things up. We are not representing all the communities. When divorce happens, the economic status of a man goes up 75%. And the status of women and children drops to 25%. This is disproportional. When you have a lot of men making the laws, they don't account for this kind of poverty. The unwillingness of the, co of the legal community to go after child welfare and that kind of thing, to get folks to make the, the money that the court says they have to make. There are a thousand ways out of that. We have to make sure that we have appropriate environmental regulations so that we don't put every toxic dump site into communities of women and children in poverty who don't have the political clout to say no. We have to make change. But it is hard to talk to each other, and debate is a place we can do that. The entire academy is under scrutiny right now. Is it worth it to go four years to college? The skill sets needed for success in the 21st century technology and global business community can be delivered in a two-year technical school. Why should you pay a bunch of money to sit in college for four years? We are having a serious dialogue about this. And every academic discipline I know of is having a serious fracture around the issues of exclusion and not accessing folks. We have to become a community that can talk to each other. And the antidote to bad speech, says the Supreme Court, is more speech. Instead of being mad at somebody who, doesn't, who says stupid things, tell them they're saying stupid things. Respect them enough to hear you. 
It might surprise you that you also might say stupid things. But if we don't talk to each other, if we hide out, if we live in a shame-based culture, and adults do that to children, I consider it child abuse. Beverly Tatum is the uh, president of Spelman College. She's also an incredible social psychologist, and I used one of her books in my fall class. And she gives this example after getting a PhD at Berkeley. Her first job uh, was in the Northeast, and she was one of the few uh, people of color on the faculty at that university. And so she's in the grocery store with her three-year-old, riding in the cart. And so another family's coming this way, and another three-year-old pokes his mother and says, what's wrong with that kid? Did he drink too much chocolate milk? <coughs> Instead of using that as a conversation point, this mother was like, shh, be quiet. We'll talk about it in the car. What does she just communicate to that three-year-old? It's bad. It's bad. So how do we climb out of that garbage? We have to talk to each other. No offense to people's parents, <laughs> but you are a generation that is smart enough and reads enough and can make a difference. At my age, I've decided that some people just have to die off before we make change. It's not a good attitude. Conversation is the way to do this. Okay. Uh, talk to each other. Communicate with respect. Number five. Avoid the isn't it a fact form of cross-examination. Isn't it a fact? Avoid, isn't it a fact? The only time you use that is to get them on record. Works on law shows. Isn't it a fact you beat your wife? Yes, well, she was a nag and the frying pan was right there. <laughs> I slugged her in the head, I couldn't help myself. That only happens on TV. If you say isn't it a fact, they're more likely to say no. The only time you say isn't it a fact is to get them on record about something they've already said to highlight that if it's a link in an argument for your judge. Next, ask questions one at a time. Really, people, one at a time. Not did your third card on solvency assume that Republicans pick up Senate seats and your second card on harm predate your first card on inherency and does your hair always look like that? One at a time. Don't confuse the judge. Last, really important, ask questions you already know the answer to. You have the advantage. If you're going to be any good at this, you've got to be prepared and know your stuff. When you all have a tournament, whenever, over the course of the next uh, week, several weeks, you're going to find or your practice debates, you're not going to know where your stuff is. Cross-examination becomes even more important. As you progress through the year, you should be absolutely prepared about what questions you need to ask to get to what dissats and links, to get to what counterplans, to get to what critiques, to get to what performance arguments, to get to whatever you want to run. Those are critical, and you should know the answers in advance. It gives you confidence, it builds credibility, and it strikes fear in the hearts of your opponents. <laughs> Suggestions for the witness. You're screwed. You don't know the questions they're going to ask. Well, actually, you should be prepared. But they can always have a new dissed. There's always something you haven't thought of. There's always something that comes up an hour before your round that happens to sink your position. Number one, <clears throat> don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Please start this one. You are teenagers. This is, it's hard for you to say, I don't know. <coughs> it's just not in your DNA. Your job is to ferret out the hypocrisy of your parents. It's a terrible job. Somebody's got to do it. I get that. Don't do it in debate. If you don't know, remember, they know the answer. Big chocolate cake on the table. You come in. You can't help yourself. You grab a big handful of the chocolate cake. You put it in your mouth. You hear your father coming down the stairs. He startles you. You go like this on your white t-shirt. Big chocolate handprint, crumbs, destroyed cake. Your father comes down. He's baked this, by the way, for the bake sale at school to support the debate team. And he's like, what have you done? 
and you go, uh, wasn't me, it was Ferd, my brother. Why, he shoved my hand in the cake and got it all over me and ran out. I think you should punish him, I do. I think you should punish him. <laughs> all right, I want you to practice. I don't know. I don't know. Thank you. See, you can do it. It doesn't hurt. It's okay. Oh my God, we have a superstar in the room. I can't even believe it. This is a graduate of the Emory National Debate Institute who was an honors everything at Emory and is a fancy graduate student. Now. Did I say make a difference in the world? Yes. Exhibit A. All right, we're just about done. <clears throat> don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Two, look at the audience and be polite. Everything I said for the questioner counts for you. And it also counts for you especially. Because they are going to ask <coughs> aggressive questions and you need to answer looking sharp and like you're not afraid and you're polite and killing with kindness. And the more aggressive they are and excited they are because they're in charge, the sweeter and more polite you are so that the judge gives you tons of points because they'd like to take you home to be their child and put that rotten one out on the street. Number three. I don't like my mom. <laughs> oh, the sorority of motherhood. Um, answer questions in a straightforward fashion. No filibusters, people. That just looks dumb. Answer questions in a straightforward manner. You're prepared. You're not afraid. You look credible. Answer in a straightforward manner. Number four, beware traps. Beware traps. Avoid the pit of doom. Now, the agenda of every questioner is to get you to the pit of doom. So they start a line of questioning and you think it's a disadvantage and you're going to sink the economy and cause nuclear war in 12 minutes. But it turns out that's not really where they're going. They want you to make all those defensive arguments because they're going a different direction and they're going to use your answers to the supposed disadvantage to launch a different position. You've got to be thinking ahead. If I answer this way, what's going to happen to my long-term strategy? You do not want to go to the pit of doom. It almost inevitably is not a good place to be. All right, next. Don't ask questions of the questioner. Those of you who are beginners, this is going to happen at least once per tournament until you figure it out. They're going to ask you a question, how much does your plan cost? Well, it certainly doesn't cost as much as the current waste of crap the status quo is, and then you launch into some, what about that, and ask them a series of questions. No, 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 no. Because at some point, the questioner will wake up. It always ends badly for the witness who does that. Don't do it. Next. Ugh. Answer the questions yourself. Don't, don't let your partner answer the questions. Now, uh, I say this because the vast majority of you have high school teachers as judges and they don't like it. A lot of college judges could care less. Those are not who you get most of the time. So you've got to do the universal and it reduces the credibility of your partner <coughs> if you constantly ask, answer questions for them. It makes the person who's speaking look like a dummy. I don't care if you like your partner. I don't care if they have the brain of a flea. You are with that person, and for this hour and a half, you love that person. He's the best colleague you have ever had in your life. And you will do everything you can to promote the credibility of that human being, because all things being equal, who wins? The people with the greatest holdings in the bank of credibility. If you don't like them, take them to the bathroom after it's over, beat them up. I don't care. But in that debate, if you want to win a debate, you do not hijack it. There are some obvious exceptions. If they are totally giving the farm away, you stop them. Oh, Ferd, I think you might have misunderstood that. Sweetly, thoughtfully. I don't think you heard the question right. Not, oh, you're such an idiot. I have to do all of the intellectual heavy. Oh, can't believe I got stuck with you. 
that says something to the judge. And when your colleague gets four speaker in the round and the 12 speaker points, that, that affects your ability to get out too, to the elimination rounds. Don't do it. All right, next. And folks, this is really the most important one. If you can do this, you're going to win so many debates. I'm just going to. Oh. Every answer features a warrant from a piece of evidence that you are calling attention to for the judge by name. They ask you a question. And you say, well, the Jones evidence was really clear when they made the argument, da 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 da. And the Smith evidence supports it in a different way, da 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 da. It makes you look credible. Everything you have, say is housed in expert testimony. Whatever you're using is warrants for claim and evidence, however you define that. And it is broad. But the idea is that you are persistently and thematically promoting your own solid, amazing 15-year-oldness into greatness because you're using expert testimony. <clears throat> and what that expert testimony looks like is the subject for much debate. I happen to agree with the idea that people's voices, organic intellectual thought is demonstrated in hip hop and other things. But referencing it, using the warrants for those claims, all of those are good. <clears throat> And all of it is subject for debate. Two parts of an argument are? Warrant. Claim and warrant. If you defeat the warrant, you defeat the claim. If everything is housed in evidence, you look smarter. The judge remembers it better. You're beginning to focus the debate on the stuff you want the judge to hear, <coughs> the things you want your opponent to engage. And it facilitates the magic debate sentence. And this is another thing that if you can do this, it is going to dramatically increase your win-loss record and it's going to dramatically increase your holdings in the bank of credibility. And that sentence is, and it sounds like math, but it's not, X is true because Y. Therefore, Z. What's X? Claim. Claim. What's Y? What's Z? Oh, we're a little confused about Z. <coughs> Vast majority of debaters, impact is right, but not necessarily in the way you're thinking. The vast majority of debaters get X is true because Y, but they don't say why it matters to the outcome of the debate. I can say my impact is, 20 million people die <clears throat> because of species contamination on coral reefs. And that is just a statement. That's at a claim level. Why does it matter to the outcome of the debate? Because it overwhelms the claim of the opponent and our number is bigger. That's a simple cost-benefit decision calculus, right? Why does it matter to the outcome of the debate? The debaters who can do that do not send the decision back to the judge to sort through all those claims and warrants and come up with their own therefore Z's. You all are all mad at your judges. Oh, the judge is so stupid. They do not know what they were doing. There are judges who are out to lunch. But at the end of the day, you participate in that when you don't do therefore Z. You wait till the very end or the top of the 2NR and 2AR to make these arguments. They should be made through the whole debate. Your decision calculus in the last two speeches should be so focused and forecasted and predicted the judge knows exactly where you're going because every sentence out of your mouth has a therefore Z. Well, as many as you can get. That's really important. You take the randomness out of the judges sorting through your claims and warrants. You all are an awesome group. Everybody's awake. You wanted coffee, but this is, I didn't have one person go to sleep. You're awesome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, white males like me. <laughs> all right, what do you want to know? What do you want to know? Yes, sir. When you're talking about 
gender only? How do you yeah. think that came about? Oh, yeah. How did gender only come about? Oh, yeah. Well, if you had an hour and a half, we could do an anthropology lecture on the various fertility societies where women were overvalued and men took over, and then there are other examples of those societies and cultures, and they bled into our world, uh, and they're reflected in most of our religious texts. And you will learn in politics there's an argument called winners win. <coughs> Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what if you have a partner that always tries to like, answer everything for you? Like, how do you play when someone's like, <clears throat> Here's the deal. If you don't, this is a very good question. Because a lot of times uh, when your partner is hijacking you, you're being polite. So you have to do that in a debate <laughs> round. But outside the debate round, when you're beating them up in the bathroom, you can say, it disrespects me when you do that, and I don't like it. Because most people who let their cross-sex get hijacked participate in that. <coughs> if you don't say no, you end up perpetuating something because you're giving it cachet. And by the way, the vast majority of you have communication issues on an interpersonal level because you're afraid to tell somebody what you think. So you get mad at your mama or your significant <laughs> other or whatever, and you reason out in your head, see, if I say that to my debate partner, they'll get mad at me, and then I might not have a partner. There's nobody else that good in my squad, and I could be screwed, so I'm just going to shut up and let it happen. But what happens is when you shove it down so far you can walk on it, then your anger is still there. You find yourself fighting over the fact that uh, they left their... Uh, you know, computer bag in the floor and you tripped on it. So you have a screaming match over something stupid like that when it's really about you disrespect me. If we don't tell people that we feel disrespected, we participate in that disrespect. If you push a bully, they'll fall right over. By the way, don't be timid about that. Speak up for yourself. Well, my question is, in the situation that your partner is saying something that you really don't want them to say in cross-examination, do you then interject yourself, or do you, like, after your speech, clarify the points they made? That's what I call a jury question. I need to know the circumstances. If they were giving the farm away, destroying your chances for victory, <coughs> then I would say, oh, Ferd, I think you've misunderstood the question, and supply the right answer. If you get to a speech and say, I think they misunderstood the question, if it was a minor thing, and this is the way it goes. But your preparation should be with a colleague. So you're all on the same page on your questions and answers as much as possible. And if they're, here's the deal, if they're less experienced than you are, which often happens, how do you get them to your level? Some of that is crashing and burning on their own. That's a pretty powerful lesson. Sometimes you don't have the luxury of that, or you're the patience for that. So have a conversation with them. You can drag a coach into it. Direct human to human conversation does a whole lot more for respect than chickening out and going to a higher up to rule on the situation. Anybody else? Y'all get lunch or something now? Yeah. Okay. You, you, you've got to be a Jablonski, so I need to see you. You're, you're